how is God's justice holy when he unjustly kills random people throughout the Bible? Or sort of a follow-on question to that, is eternal different is eternal justice different from temporal or this life justice? And I would answer that one with yes. So the stories where this question often comes up is when somebody's killed in the Bible and it looks like God's the one who killed him. And in several of the stories, God is the one who killed him, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. So just as a few examples, there is Onan in Genesis chapter 38. There's Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10. There's Uzzah in 2 Samuel chapter 6. There's David's baby with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 12. There's 42 young boys in 2 Kings chapter 2. And then there's Ananias and Sapphira in Acts uh, chapter 5. And those are just a few examples. But the question around these that often comes up is how can God be just? And how is God holy when, when he does things like this? So... I think a better question to ask in at least two of those cases is how is God holy when he allows things like this? If you look at the story of David's baby with Bathsheba, God predicts the death and then later allows it to happen. If you look, look at the 42 young boys in 2 Kings, they were harassing one of God's prophets. The prophet cursed them and as a result of the curse, God allowed the young boys to die. And it was a rather gruesome death if you read the story. So how is God just when, when this happens? So for the encouragement of any Christian seeing this video or, or having this discussion, I'll point to eternity and say that for eternity's sake, all sin is equal. This won't do you any good if you're having an apologetics conversation with an atheist. Uh, but for a Christian, this, this should be encouraging. We need to remember that for eternity's sake, all sin is equal, and a bully is the same as a slanderer, a slanderer is the same as a rapist, a rapist is the same as a murderer, and a murderer is the same as somebody who commits genocide. They're all equal for eternity's sake. And because God is holy and cannot tolerate sin, he is just, and his justice is holy when he punishes sin with eternity in hell. Of course, the exception is if you believe that Jesus Christ paid that penalty for you as a substitute for you, then you get out of that. And you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, then go to heaven instead of to hell. This won't do any good if you're talking to an atheist because most atheists don't believe that there's an afterlife. But for Christians, that, that point can be comforting. So the next point there's part of it that will be comforting or encouraging for Christians, and there's part of it that will be helpful if you're having the, the conversation with an atheist. So temporal justice, or this life justice, is different from eternal justice because in this life, the harm that's caused by some sin is different and possibly worse than the harm that is caused by other sin. So for this life, on this side of eternity, not all sin is equal. So in order to have an orderly society, we have to, in order to have justice, we have to make punishments that fit the crime. And we have to make sure that the person who committed the crime or did the wrong is the person who is punished. So when we're thinking of justice in this sense, how can we say that God is just? First way that I would answer that question is to say that no one but Jesus has ever actually been innocent. And so when we're asking this question and, and we're looking at the victims of this so-called injustice and calling them innocent, we're actually being inaccurate because they were sinners. They're not innocent. So in contrast to Jesus, no one is innocent. Everyone is guilty. Again, that's something more for the Christian, not really for an atheist. Won't do that that conversation any good. I think this next point will, though. And that's that active and willful sin takes you outside of God's protection. Or to take the God terminology out of it, active and willful criminal behavior takes you outside the protection of the law. 
and negligence of lawful behavior can potentially cause criminal consequences for your children. Look at the story of, of David and Bathsheba. The death of their baby was a result of their sin or of their adultery and their cons David's conspiracy to commit murder. So that negligence of lawful behavior and that criminal behavior and that sinful behavior had the result of death for the baby. The person who was being punished was David, but we look at the baby and say, well, the baby was innocent. Why, why is the baby punished? The baby isn't the one being punished. David is. In the story with those 42 young boys, what happens was there, the prophet is coming to the town. They come out of the town. They start harassing the prophet. The prophet curses them. And then some bears come out of the woods and maul these boys. Are the boys the ones being punished or are their parents the ones being punished? Is the greater society the one being punished? The role of the prophet was to act as if he were a prosecuting attorney against Israel, bringing out and pointing out Israel's sin against God. And if you read the, the whole of Kings, both First and Second Kings, you'll find that this particular season of Israel's history was not a very holy season. It was a very sinful season. So in, in my opinion, it wasn't the, those boys that were being punished. It was their parents and the society as a whole. And you can, you can look even today and you can sociologically see this playing itself out with street gangs. There is negligence, there's parental negligence, there's the criminal behavior, the violence, the deaths that are all associated with the street gangs, and then when those boys become parents, there's more parental negligence, and it's a cycle that really feeds itself. This was what was going on in Israel at the time when those 42 young boys were killed. They were functioning as a street gang, harassing the prophet. So when we look at, at that story and we ask the question, how is God just for allowing that? The justice isn't being meted out against those young boys. It's being meted out against the parents and against the society who allowed that sort of thing to happen. And if that doesn't answer your question, if that doesn't satisfy the objections that you have to that, the, the death of these young boys or of David's baby, then I have to say, well, ultimately we, we don't know the mind of God. Scripture is pretty clear on that. God's ways are higher than ours. They are different than ours. And what in those stories appear to us as random motives for God to cause or to allow somebody's death, in God's mind, there's probably very specific reasons for causing or allowing those deaths. We know that in all things, God works for his own glory, not because he's a narcissist, because, but because he is God. A narcissist thinks they deserve some kind of glory because they think they've met some kind of standard. That's arrogance because that standard hasn't actually been met by someone who is narcissistic. God has met that standard, and it's okay for him to work for his own glory. The fact that we can say, well, I don't, I don't know with these kinds of stories, that I'm, I'm okay with that. Not everyone will be, but I'm okay with that. What that tells me is that God, when he wrote those stories, when he conveyed those stories to the writers of Scripture, is that he didn't think we needed to know the specific purposes in, in mind. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to God. And I think this, that verse applies to these stories. So even though we can't know God's motives in every situation for causing or allowing a, a certain death, we can look at those stories and we can see a thread through all of them. And in all cases, they cause the people to start to fear God. And even though that doesn't sound appealing to us, God is not shy in the Bible about using fear to get people to turn to him, to turn away from sin, and to turn toward him. And the Bible, in fact, says in a couple of places, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, 
in Psalm 111, verse 10, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so as a result of these deaths that might appear unjust, people start to fear God and they turn toward him. And I think that perhaps is the result that God is going for. Not to appease our sense of what justice should happen. So thank you for watching this video. If you're a Christian, I hope that you found it encouraging. If you are not a Christian, I hope that you found it thought-provoking. And perhaps I have helped to address some of your objections to the holiness of God, the justness of God, and to Christianity as a whole. Um, if you want to contact me or ask me another question, my contact info should be below the video here on YouTube, or you can go to my church's website. My contact info will be posted there as well. Thank you. Have a great day.